Welcome back to another episode of Innovations and Integrations. I'm Ryan Huffman with Team Kuzi. Um, welcome, guys. Appreciate you taking time with us today. Why don't you introduce yourselves and we'll kick it off. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm Max Brickman, I'm Managing Director uh, and Founder of Heartland Ventures. And I'm Connor McGinnis, also with Heartland Ventures, a partner with the fund based in Indianapolis. Yeah, so you know, you guys have a really interesting story. How do we, uh, how do we get here and how did you get started? Yeah, um, started the fund in 2017, uh, moved up to South Bend, Indiana. Uh, it's a city of you know, 100,000 people, I guess not exactly known as a venture capital hub, but you know, what a, a city like South Bend has when I learned when I, I moved there was you have a ton of these established operating companies that are doing anywhere from you know, 50 million to a few billion in revenue that have a ton of expertise, a ton of buying power. You know, sometimes they're second, third, fifth generation businesses that, that know their space incredibly well, but don't necessarily have the same level of connectivity to the coast and to you know, technology companies. And they're wanting to, right? They're, they're wanting to innovate. They're wanting to see technology that can really make them more globally competitive. Um, and when I started meeting these folks and, and seeing kind of their interest level in doing that, and then comparing that to my friends that were out in the Bay Area that were starting companies, that we're targeting, you know, manufacturing or logistics, um, but seeing that those two groups really weren't connecting, and there yeah. weren't very many lines of communication between the two, um, ended up starting the fund, really to bring those two groups together yeah. to identify the company out in San Francisco who wants to chat with the, you know, manufacturing company in Elkhart, Indiana, and, yeah. and vice versa. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, Connor, how did you get involved in? this adventure? Yeah, kind of a, a long and winding road for me. I'm an attorney by trade, but left that long ago, uh, thankfully. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, but but actually grew up on the East Coast, which I think gets weaved into the story a little bit in terms of who our different sets of stakeholders are. Been out in the Midwest for about 10 years, though, um, to to work initially, like I said, on the legal side of things, but then jump to a really boutique consulting firm based in Indianapolis, mm -hmm. where a lot of what we were doing was bringing technology into legacy businesses, really across the country, but into privately held, oftentimes family-owned businesses in industries that you might see as, as unsexy. So yeah. think construction right. or manufacturing or logistics. I linked up with, with Max uh, and Mark, our third partner, about three and a half years ago, and it's, uh, it's been a fun ride since. Yeah, I think there's a lot of synergies between what you guys do and, and where you guys stop and where we start. You know, we, we're the guys that go in and we actually implement these technologies. Um, but in a lot of ways, and I think why, uh, you know, we hit it off pretty early on is you guys create these marriages or these partnerships and these friendships and connecting good people with good people is, is the ethos of kind of how we operate. So I think, you know, you guys are helping, you know, bring these companies and get them exposure in the Midwest. And that's kind of you know what we do on a daily basis, and we see things, and we're always talking to people. And when there's an opportunity for us to say, hey, you know, this great technology partner, whether it's an AI company or a new restaurant technology or something that's an automated piece in the manufacturing space, we like to introduce them to existing partners in other categories. So what we're doing right now with a lot of people is we do a ton in the restaurant industry, but everything in the way I was raised, being a retailer, is everything starts at retail or restaurant, and it kind of just scales outwardly. So. If you look at a restaurant, it's not that different than a million square foot warehouse. It's just a bigger scale. So tell me about some of the stuff you guys are seeing right now. Um, I think over the past, well, you know, just tell me about some of the trends you guys are seeing right now. Um, and then I'll add my next question. I don't want to sure. that down. Yeah, yeah. I think we could take this in a bunch of different directions, right? The, the one trend everybody's speaking about is the, um, the general economy, which certainly will, will impact a lot of what we do. But if we can leave that to the side for a second, some specific business challenges that we're hearing about from our uh, stakeholders on the legacy business side of things. Supply chain, right? That's one you hear about all the time. Uh, when we look at our logistics stakeholders, trying to understand what that actually means right. in a world where e-commerce is, is kind of eating the world, yeah. uh, that introduces some pretty insane requirements on the on the parts of folks like Amazon in terms of if you want to be in their ecosystem and you need to deliver in prime, that means right. getting something to Alaska in a day. Yep. How are you going to do that? Well, technology probably has a place in that space. Um, and just the overall variability of e-commerce environments is something that we uh, speak about with our logistics stakeholders 
really on a daily basis. Yeah. In construction, um, the supply chain pains are present, but they've been present since well before whatever this this is that we're in today, yeah. well before COVID. Uh, and that's something that's led to some investments that we've made yeah. on the manufacturing side, of course, uh, supply chain ends up being an issue there. Uh, but, but at the same time, there are many opportunities in the way of introducing technology to address supply chain challenges and labor challenges. So there's a, there's a bunch of different directions we can go, Ryan, but that, that comes to mind because of some recent conversations we've had. Yeah, I think that the marriages and finding the right technologies with the right partners, is, and I get this vibe from you guys, is you know everyone's like, oh, we need to innovate and we need to remove the, the human component. Well, the human component is, is everything to everything. It is, it, you know, so right now it's, you know, how do you use technology to make things more efficient or more effective or, or more functional for people to operate it? And whether it's technology that's, you know, having people, no one wants to be a cashier, and that's not a, a bad thing. I, I grew up as a cashier. It's saying that you can do more meaningful jobs that, you know, you know, repurpose things. And, and as you know, our supply chain and everything has more demands than it's ever had before. Um, you know, that human components there. So tell me a little bit, because I think that's a big focus of what you guys are doing and your ethos is like, what, what, where does a human component come into this technology? I mean, there's the financial side of it. There's technology side of it. But tell me, tell me about the, the human side of it and how you guys use the relational side of all this. Yeah, I mean, the, the human side of it for, you know, how our our, the, our portfolio companies or the technologies we're investing really impact people is, I guess, kind of twofold. You know, one is they, to, to your point, you know, the then goal isn't to be a, a cashier and, and technology can really help take away the, uh, the dangerous jobs and the, the lower paying jobs and provide opportunity for, uh, you know, jobs that are, that are more fulfilling. Um, we invested in a company called Gravango that does that. Um, I mean, it's cashierless checkout where, you know, you walk, walk into a grocery store, you grab a few items off the shelf and it recognizes what you've, what you've grabbed. And when you go to check out, it already has a list of items. Yeah. Um, so you don't need to, to check out. And what that allows for is the person who was the cashier is now able to do a higher paid position, um, either on the technology side there or just somewhere else within the company. And in a world where it's very difficult to, to fill these positions and where, you know, shelves are left empty and, and you know, there it creates problems for, for everybody um, by not having enough enough labor. Being able to t remove those positions is going to help everybody. And the other would be, you know, companies like, uh, you know, one of our more recent investments, a company called Clara, that really focuses directly on identifying people within companies who are sort of underutilized. You know, people that maybe wouldn't, you know, speak out and say, you know, I want to be trained in, in X so that I can move up into this higher role, but are more than capable of doing that and want to do it, maybe just don't have the personality type to mm -hmm. speak up and say something. Right. Um, the, the, you know, this is an example of a technology that's helping to identify those people right. and, and move them up within the company. That's incredible. So let's talk about that. And, you know, I think you and I, we, we kind of hit it off over Rabango and everything that they're yeah. doing. And, you know, with my retail background, it really resonated with me. But, like, let's talk about like, how do these different technologies catch your attention? And I think talk about a little bit more because I think, you know, there's a lot of VCs that say, hey, we want to do a cash influx and hopefully this thing takes off and we can, you know, liquidate it or do what we have to do. But I think your guys' uh, approach is much different because you're actually, not only are you helping them, you know, with capital, you're also helping them get exposure. And that's exactly what we do on a daily basis, too. Absolutely. It's like we work with great partners and we want to put great partners in front of our other great partners and hopefully help everybody grow together. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, and we've recognized that in you guys. Yeah. You guys have already made a ton of introductions and have enjoyed working with you all. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's very much the focus of we want to invest in technologies where when we connect them to folks, yeah. they respond positively. Um, you know, we want to invest in technologies that deliver a true, you know, tangible ROI. And, you know, a lot of technologies, and you mentioned ones where you, know, you want to throw money at it and, and hope that it works. If there's a true ROI, people are going to want to continue to buy the product. And th there's, a, there's a reason to. So by integrating, by bringing in the customers to the decision-making process, um, we're able to one connect the startup to customers, uh, which helps the startup, and then two validate whether or not there's there's an ROI. Um, so, what was the name of the the human capital technology you just mentioned that helps people uh, kind of Clara? Clara. So, 
something that was interesting said to me a couple weeks ago by a, a very large national company is they approach technology in two ways. And it's one is the, the consumer facing technologies and they say, hey, this is gonna make the, the experience for the customers better. And then they separate it for the operational uh, technologies. So when you talk about Clara and everything, there's nothing externally really sexy about it. It's kind of like selling a point of sale system to a retailer to or a restaurant group. There's nothing, you're not getting a ROI. It's not gonna generate more revenue for you, but it's functional and it makes things faster and more efficient. And maybe it does a better job reporting. But with something like Clara, like how are you guys helping those folks get exposure? Like, I mean, obviously it's great because right now the human component is more tight than it's ever been. But what does that look like for you? You know, you guys say, hey, we're gonna invest in you, but then we're gonna take you to this. Tell me about a little bit about that journey. Yeah, I think all of our investments are a reaction to the pain points that we've digested after interacting with our friends across legacy business in the Midwest. Okay. Um, so, but for those conversations, we wouldn't have gotten excited about Clara, specifically conversations around how do we find people? How do we keep people? How do we move folks from what we know will be jobs that get automated into higher value positions? Mm -hmm. And how do we do that in a way that enriches the overall organization in addition to the individual? So those were the key challenges we were issued by interacting with legacy business. We've been looking at human capital solutions for the entire time Heartland has been in existence. So it's not as if we then found Clara and invested in Clara, yep. right? We probably looked at four or five dozen other uh, tools that said they could, could do something at least similar to what Clara is, is now doing. But the next step in the process is to bring the ones that really shine, the startups that really shine to these legacy businesses and say, what do you think? The most important stakeholder to any startup is their their customers, right. especially their earliest customers who are, you know, let's be honest, they're taking a chance on them. Yeah. So it's our job to make those connections happen. And frankly, it's in our interest to do so prior to making an investment decision. Yeah. So, you know, we see that every day where someone will say, hey, Ryan, we saw you working with this AI company or we saw you working with this EV charging station company. Can you introduce us to this? Or uh, you know, we'll sit down, and I think it's probably similar to what you guys do with your guys' you know, end users. You sit down and say, what, what, what problems are you guys that need to be fixed yesterday? And what challenges are you facing? So I guess it's that chicken or egg analogy. Do you guys like to, I mean, I'm sure you guys, it goes both ways. Do you go find a really cool company and then go find businesses and users to match it? Or do you start with the end users and hear about their challenges and, and work upstream? It's more the latter. Yeah. It, it really is. Um, mainly because there, there are a lot of cool companies out there yeah, right, doing right. all sorts of cool things. But if we want to be a value-add partner to the companies we do back, then we, we, we need to recognize what that value is. We have done that, and it is bringing folks with issues to founders that can solve those issues. Yep. Um, so we should start with those issues, right? Yeah, yeah we, we, we see that all the time where people are like, hey, this is a constant pain point. And they just don't know because they don't have exposure. They don't have the ability. So I think that's really interesting with you guys. You're going out and you're looking at companies and you're saying, hey, this is what these folks are doing. And whether it's, you know, our whole business came out of the lab automation space. And, you know, we went into the financial sector and the warehouse distribution sector. And, you know, getting that robust exposure to different things, it allows you to be agile in real time. This may have never been done in this way before, but a couple of tweaks we can scale down or scale up to meet your needs. So... Tell me a little bit about what you guys are seeing today that's got you really excited. I, I'd back up, and um, we could certainly talk about some specific technologies, but it, it's easier to talk maybe thematically and um, mention just, just one thing, and then I'd be interested in your thoughts, Max. But So SaaS, right? Um, <laughs> a giant space that a lot of venture funds deploy capital into, yep. software as a service for, for businesses that are looking to do some some workflow that they're doing today more effectively um, and at a lower cost. We work with some industries who would be, frankly, later adopters, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that, that lends itself more to what I would call verticalized SaaS. So not a, a uh, uh, software product that is embracing, you know, all industries as potential customers, but really honing in on one particular industry because they're familiar with one particular problem um, that they can effectively address. 
And when you think about construction, logistics, manufacturing, again, I, I say those three because those are the ones we focus on. Mm -hmm. They're folks that when they sit down across from a founder, they're going to they're gonna want to hear, to Max's earlier comment, a real solution to a real problem, yeah. right? Um, vertical approach, a verticalized SaaS uh, product will speak in the language of that stakeholder mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, take take Salesforce, right? Like your your most well-known, biggest right. uh, behemoth of a SaaS product, which certainly at this point has different go-to-market strategies for, for different verticals. Um, but a product that's purely built to address this problem in construction is something that, frankly, we can get excited about yeah. more quickly. Knowing that you master that, all of a sudden you have a, uh, a nice foothold in a giant, very fragmented industry yeah. that really is screaming for some improvements. 100%. So you master one workflow there, then you can go deeper into that, that one vertical as opposed to really shallow across a horizontal approach. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. You got anything to add to that? Or? I think that's well said. <laughs> yeah, so t to that, you know, uh, I'm a high energy guy and, and peoples will get me out of bed every morning. Obviously, you know, uh, technology is the, the vehicle and the weapon of choice where we're trying to go do things, but it's really the people that get me excited hearing all these different stories. And you guys see to see crazy things from these legacy companies that you're implementing technology into these startups and everything. So let's get into the DNA of the decision makers. First, I want to know what you guys, like, what is the typical founder of a tech company? And I'm, that, that's a loaded question, I know, because everyone beats to their own drum. But I want to know what you guys think, like, over some common characteristics you're seeing in people. Obviously, they got the entrepreneurial spirit. And you might have really technologically savvy people who are bad business people, and then business people whose technology is not that great. And we see that all the time. It happens in the beer industry as well. Yeah. Great brewers, their uh, business acumen is not great, or business people whose their beer sucks. So we, you see it both ways. But in the technology space, kind of paint me a picture for like what those founders look like, those innovators look like. And then on the other side, from the marriage side, the people that are open-minded, because there's people who get stuck in their ways and they're like, hey, I, I want to innovate, but they're, they're, they're slow to make decisions or they're not, they're, they're not embracing things that are outside of the current status quo. So kind of paint a picture of what both those people look like. Yeah, I mean, I think meeting both of those folks are, is probably the best part of the job. Yeah, it's so fun. Uh, the ability to meet both you know, a, a tech founder in the Bay Area to a, you know, either first gen or fifth gen business owner where, you know, they grew up with it and their great, great grandfather grew up with it. And that's, you know, what they sat around the dinner table talking about. And, and they are just so ingrained in that space, whatever that space is that, you know, they know it better than, than anybody. Um, I think the, the level of kind of passion between both of them, especially first gen is really actually, I think there's more in common, then that's different, uh, especially with first gen. And I think that that leads to the more established kind of legacy businesses really enjoying talking to the startups, yeah. where you know, at first glance they seem very different, but again, they're both trying to make their mark in the same space, just in a very different way. Um, but what we really look for in, in founders, you know, is the is the hunger and the and the drive, and and you know the delivery really, right. you know, and being able to execute. You know, one of our founders came from a, a blue collar family in Singapore. You know, his, I think his dad was a truck driver, his mom was a dishwasher, and uh, you know, grew up really with that that hunger, and and came to the U.S. and you know, went to Harvard and then MIT, and you know, one of the first employees at WeChat in the U.S. and and really just kind of leveraged that hunger, and but understood, still understood the the hourly worker space because that's yeah. what he grew up with, that's what right. his parents were in, and went to San Francisco and and committed himself to solving you know that problem or, or addressing that problem and started this company called workstream uh and, and we uh we i remember when we were still kind of vetting uh you know whether or not we were going to be investing we we brought him out to uh to south bend and we connected him to 13 of our investors 13 of these corporates in south bend indiana and elkhart and like the rv industry yeah. out of the 13 he left with 11 signed contracts Good for him. He's got. He's doing something, right? Yeah, and so it shows, you know, his his drive, his his ability to sell, but also just his ability, to, his passion. And I think that very much came through. Yeah. It was still a very early stage product, and and then again, his ability to execute and actually deliver after that. Um, so you know, we really look for those things, and that's why that's a part of our diligence process is yeah. being able to see kind of the founder in action. I, I love it. I think that the passion that is such a. a 
undervalued. If, if someone comes in and they're like, oh, I got this new technology and they're, and they're not excited about it, and they're not, you know, got the energy behind it, it's, it there's, it's, it's hard to get to do that. But that is very contagious. Absolutely. And it can really, I mean, be the um, stepping off point to, for something to kind of explode. And even if someone comes in and they're energized and say, hey, I've got this product today and I'm willing to evolve this within your brand, whether it's a manufacturer or it's a logistics company, where this product today, I'm going to customize this to meet your needs, and this is how I'm gonna grow this. I think that's such a valuable thing, and I think as you talk about some of these legacy businesses, people dig it because they know when they started that business or their dad started it, that business looked vastly different, and they hit, you know, broke ground on day one than it did today, and it is in 10 years. Um, so you know, let's talk about timing. So the pandemic and in the tech space, we saw everybody, the entire world, take a pause on everything for about 30 seconds. And then the technology stuff, just like, you know, gangbusters. And we saw, um, especially like the restaurant space, I always use this analogy, is like everyone was like hitting the accelerator and now everyone's punching their foot through the damn floor of the car and their Fred Flo's doing it because they're kind of reinventing everything. So let's talk about, you know, the acceleration and, the, and some of the trends you've seen as far as speed and ability to people wanting to, to move fast. Uh, everyone's talked about this recession, and I'm sure that's you know high on your guys' list. And uh, so, tell me about you know how innovation and you know, what you guys are doing. It's so there's multiple tentacles that can kind of approach all of this. I know this is a loaded question, but you know what are you guys seeing as far as pace of play, and uh, you know how quickly are your end users are you know willing to adapt right now and, and kind of move forward? It it depends, right? Um, and it depends on a lot of the. There's some assumptions built in there about what the state of the economy is today, yeah. right? And um, it's tough to say. And and I would I would say our stakeholders on the legacy business side of things are all across the spectrum in terms of folks that maybe are feeling a not a full fledged recession. I don't yeah. think any of them are seeing that yet, but certainly a, a hangover from uh, all of the really frothy times in the past 24, yeah. 30 months. Um, and then that's going to impact their view of tech. And, and then the other depends is what's the culture of that company with regard to how technology can be a, a solution, um, an investment, uh, not an expense yeah. in a time where you might need to do more with less, right? And that comes down to both culture, but also the way in which you look out 5, 10, 15, 20 years. We work with a lot of long-term oriented legacy businesses that's why they're legacy businesses right. right we work with a couple that are literally sixth generation businesses those folks are more likely to look at each and every business decision with the future in mind yeah. and that's where these longer term trends that we've talked about yeah. come into play and so they're willing to invest as long as there's that roi which we've also addressed yeah i think it's what like Less than one percent of businesses actually make it to generation three. So you're talking about six generation. That's yeah. insane. It's not too many. No, it's. I mean, it's insane. Um, we look. we uh, this is is worth sharing. I think Ryan, we work with one manufacturing company that this is one of the six generation businesses, and we heard from generation five, who is in the process of kind of handing off to his son that he'll be the first of uh, of any generation to retire with all ten digits. On his hands. That's amazing. Because, <laughs> you know, the, the first four were yeah. that hands on. Yeah. Well, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, I love stories like that. That just gets you, like, that gets you excited. I mean, you just hear things like that in every spectrum. So let's talk about, again, I, I'm so focused on the human side of all this, the, the culture. And when you guys are evaluating this marriage that you're creating and, you know, investing and doing all of this, how important is the culture? I think it's really important. I mean, you've probably seen a technology that's going to solve all the problems, but the culture's not there to kind of embed, embrace the technology. Have you seen products fail because the culture on the receiving end hasn't been set up for success? Uh, I think yes, and, and yeah. more more specifically for, for us, it, it's usually an indication that we shouldn't be investing. Right. Where if we're you know, bringing a technology from the coast out to the Midwest, you know, we can do as much diligence as we can, and we have our lens as, yeah. as investors, but they need to be able to, you know, sell this to the end customer. Yeah. And in many cases, that's a manufacturing company in a small town in Indiana. Yeah. And I think that oftentimes there's sort of a culture in startups in San Francisco where they're, um, 
you know, this is flyover country. You know, this is the, the, the rest of the country. You know, this is not, you know, this is the forgotten, you know, area. And so I think having a culture where there's a certain amount of, of like respect and humility and, and, and you know, excitement to be able to connect yeah. with, with the companies here, I think is incredibly important. And that shows itself in actually being able to close customers yeah. here. So I think that's really how it ends up manifesting. That's what we end up seeing. Yeah. And then there's a there's a, a challenge that's uh, true for all startups, no matter who they're selling into, and and it's a part of being early, right? And that's resolved by being very diligent with each one of your early customers. Sure, you're going to get critical feedback, right? Yeah. That's gold. That's value for you. Um, now address it and figure out a way to address it while keeping your customer. Right. Yeah, we see, and, and um, this may be the bad example, I might get me in trouble, but it is what it is. So we see, you know, companies that they want to be perceived as innovative or they're doing cool forward-thinking things and they'll throw a robot in a restaurant or they'll mm. do X, Y, or Z. But when it comes down to crunch time and it's time that you're, you know, you're having mad rush, that robot's getting shut off. Yeah. And it's there, and it's always, you know, in eyesight so the consumers can see it. But that robot doesn't, you know, functionality is not, it doesn't have a long-term lifespan. And so I'm, I'm guessing when you guys look at things like this, something that's really sexy but doesn't have longevity, or you guys don't think it's like that, does that go into your evaluation process where you're like, hey, this is something that's cool, but it's not something that's going to really be you know, part of this business's culture? I mean, I guess that's a two-part question. Yeah, I, I, I have two thoughts on it. I mean, absolutely, it needs to be um, seen. It, it comes back to what we said earlier about real-world value, mm -hmm. right? And the other thing is when you talk about like the, the cool robot that a, a corporate deploys, we have a, it's not our saying, it's, it's really a rule of thumb across the board at this point. And it's the, the innovation arm of your, your typical corporate. That's where innovation goes to die, oh, yeah. right? Yep. That stood up so that perhaps the um, C-suite can tell the board, hey, we've, we're, we're, we're embracing the future, we're investing some money in it. Uh, but we typically counsel our portfolio companies that you kind of want to stay away from that group. Right. You want to go to the folks that have P&L responsibility on a day-to-day -day basis who have a problem and you're going to solve their problem. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the, the P&L thing is always interesting because it's the lifeblood. You know, if the P&L is not to where it needs to be, even if you, you can innovate all you want, but you're going to, that robot or that piece of technology, that automation is going to have dust on it in a year and it's going to be in a dark building because it's not going to be... You know, you can see things like that. And we see that every day with people who are like, you're going from being a pretty simple, like black and white business to you're trying to add all these different things at once. And you're like, this is going to get messy. What does that look like in your guys' relationship? I sat in a meeting that you guys hosted with Grabongo specifically, and you helped them along. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, we it kind of goes back. I guess how, how I see that question is it goes back to you know, focus on the ROI. Yep. And, and I think if these companies um, kind of have a, an obsession for that, it's going to resonate with the customer. It's not going to end up sitting on a shelf. Um, and it, you know, it, it'll, it'll be there long term. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. So let's talk about the Heartland specifically. Um, you guys have a great foundation story. We kind of touched on that a little bit. But talk about, you know, why Heartland how you guys differentiate yourselves, because you guys are much different than every VC and, and kind of everything. So tell me a little bit of like, hey, this is your, your soapbox speech, your, your sales pitch here. And I, I don't get that vibe from you either. Like, that's not our style. You never see me sit there and hard sell somebody. It's not, and I, I don't get that vibe from you guys at all. It's, it's making sure it works for everybody. And you know, in this case, it's, it's you guys, it's a technology company and it's the end user. It's creating that triangle of success. So tell me a little bit about that. I think that's, that's what we look for is that yeah. triangle of success, right? <laughs> You know, we want, the way we look at it is there's amazing technology that's being developed all around the country, more and more in the Midwest, but still predominantly on the coast uh, or in major cities. And you have these incredible companies that, you know, established companies and the, the legacy companies that are spread across the Midwest and oftentimes not in the, in the urban cores and not on the coast. And there's a huge amount of value to bring those two together for, for everybody that's involved. The, the three, P, the three uh, points to, your, to the triangle. Right. Uh, you know, the startup wants to connect with the corporate because they're getting feedback and customers. The corporate wants to talk to the startup because that's going to make their business more effective. And us as the investor, 
we want to see that interaction yeah. because if the corporate wants to work with the startup, well, that, that's product market fit. Yeah. And, and that, you know, at, at a seed stage or an early stage investment, that's not a given. So what we what really differentiates us is we look for, you know, we make those connections and we look for product market fit before we actually make the investment. And we do that by actually bring, bringing in yeah. the customers and the corporates uh, to that conversation. So I had the, uh, the good fortune of going to a happy hour probably a month and a half ago, and it was with uh, the one of the local tech groups. And I'm going to butcher the name here, but it's um, like they're calling themselves the Silicon Valley of the Midwest, and they have these cool homage T-shirts with the globe on them and this tech stuff. And um, are, are you guys seeing it reverse at all, where you're taking Heartland Midwest companies and you're getting them exposure on the coast? Uh, and it's okay. If it's, I'll be if excited when that yet. day yeah. comes. And that's not, I think, you know, for a lot of the companies that are on the coast, they should be in the Midwest. This right. is where their customers are, right. right? I mean, yes, it's less expensive here. Yes, all these other things. But if you're selling into, you know, many different, if you're selling into manufacturing or logistics or, or certain industries, you should be, you know, close to your customers. You're going to get the feedback. You're going to get the exposure, the connections, um, the, t the key talent that has a background in that industry. Yeah. Um, so we're seeing more and more of that of these companies that are, you know, relocating here. It, we're setting up secondary operations, right. but I think there's so much low-hanging fruit for them to sell into this area yeah. that there's not as much of a need for once they are here than to need to sell on the coast. There's more of a need for the coast to sell into the Midwest. Yeah, I think it's kind of that uh, that analogy is just like so everyone thinks everything is coming out of Silicon Valley or the San Francisco region and everything. Yeah. So so tell me why you think I mean as at first you know Google everybody's out there. Well, why is it that region of the country? What makes it so attractive to the the nerds, if you will? Yeah, I mean, it, it there's a you know historical reason of why everybody's there, but I think at the core of it, you know, what, what you really feel when you go there is, you know, the the talents there, the money's yeah. there, um, and and because there's that that density, things just happen a lot faster. Yeah, and so you know, if you go sit in a coffee shop in San Francisco, I mean, it the, the you know in terms of culture people do not stop working. Yeah. And every dinner, every coffee, every meeting that you, you know, if you were to walk by a table, yep. is going to be talking about work. Yeah. Uh, every conversation. And so, you know, it's the it's like DC for, yeah. you know, political junkies yeah. or or LA for, for media. You know, it, yeah. it, it's that hub for, for tech and for venture. Yeah. Um, so again, you end up, you know, just flushing out ideas much more quickly, being much closer to your capital source, to your, your yeah. key talent. Uh, and it, it is kind of infectious. I think in a lot of ways, um, there's a little bit of a safety net there to be entrepreneurial. So we, we met a guy probably two years ago who we were talking to him and he had a great product and um, we're like, dude, I just need you to be like more fiery about it and, and kind of push it forward. And I mean, very successful, uh, great guy. But uh he said something, he goes, if this doesn't work out, like he wasn't stressed out about it failing, he goes, I can go get a job at Google or anywhere making $400,000, no problem. <laughs> and I was just like, like I think that some of that Midwest entrepreneur spirit is, if I fail in the Midwest and I'm starting something, I'm homeless and my family's feeding, where like these guys are so brilliant that they do have this safety net. So maybe that's why they migrate there. That's just me thinking. I don't think they're any smarter. I, I think it's just they they kind of know the game yeah, out and there. They, and and they, they, yep. they know that they're that there's something else. And I and I think yeah, the value of being in the Midwest too is the that industry expertise. I and mean, yeah. if you're gonna start something that's targeting the manufacturing sector and you've lived in San Francisco your whole life uh -huh. and you think you read, you know, a few books on it and you're an expert, you know, that you're you're going to be proven wrong pretty quickly. Yeah. And it comes back to, we mentioned passion being important for an entrepreneur. Like that's right. Okay. That's, that's true. But what does that actually mean? Yeah. Um, understanding what, what fuels the fire. Yeah. Why are you passionate about this particular thing? Yeah. Is super important. Oh yeah. Right. Like, is it because you, you read about like the riches of a successful entrepreneur? Yeah. Hopefully it's not that, but what is it about that particular problem? that you're trying to address? Yeah. Why that? Yeah. Because we're, we're backing um, the person and, and the product they have today, but we're, just, we're really just backing the fact that somebody's going to solve this problem right. because this is a big enough problem that it's going to be worth yeah. a, lot, a lot of money. Right. Now, chances are you're, you're not going to have it right, right away. So we don't want you who, if you're an entrepreneur that we're choosing to back among the you know, hundreds of deals we look at, 
chances are like you are a very intelligent, marketable person that yeah. can get a good job somewhere else and make make great money. Um, we want you obsessed with that problem and fixing oh, yeah. that problem. Yeah, I think that's probably is part of your guys's your process is like understanding that origin story you talked about. Um, the guy from Singapore earlier, like that dude is going to figure out a way to get it done. And, and you know, he's going to work around the clock to get it done. So I think that and he's now story. raised over $100 million from Founders Fund and some top tier funds. And yeah, yeah. He, he'll, he'll make it happen. So that'll, and that all that good stuff will follow yeah. that obsession, right? So, you know, there's tech stars and there's all these other different groups of people, you know, they, they use those outlets to, you know, drive revenue for whatever it happens to be. You're, you're giving advice to somebody and, you know, your guys' approach doesn't work for everybody because other people have different, you know, end games and everything. I appreciate your approach and I, I love what you guys are doing. But tell me a little bit, like, you guys are giving a new technology person uh, some advice about as they're raising money. What do you think are some key points to highlight for people as they're looking to, you know, raise capital and scale? Yeah, I mean, I'd say focus on the relationships that you have, I think the best way to raise money, the best way to connect with a, an investor is through an introduction. Yeah. And so I think leverage the relationships you have and may, and show the the traction that you're 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 having. Yeah. So focus on the traction and then also market that traction. Right. Uh, and leverage that to get introductions to other investors. Yeah. And and that's going to create the buzz. That's going to create the the people who who want to invest. Um, as opposed to just being focused about focused on you know, uh, you know, j- c- convincing people why your problem is uh, is important right. enough. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. You need to add to that. I, I think there are some some textbook things right that any venture investor is going to look for that that are not necessarily unique to us in terms of when I said earlier the the the, the size of the problem that that's really is a stand in for, for market size, yeah. right? You want a massive market potential for tons of growth. Um, whether that's because you have some growth hack behind your go to market strategy yeah. or just the virality of the product inherently. Right. Uh, and then of course we're looking to back folks that can get to 80 plus percent margins. Right. right? So if you can do all that then um, you'll, you'll get people's attention yep. as long as you can also present yourself as the person who would rather die than, not get this done yeah right and and i in thinking about what i said previously about where the passion comes from one one thing that is not necessary but we do see a lot with successful founders is some subject matter expertise themselves so they've worked in that industry yeah. that they're trying to address right. right they've tried to they've dealt with that problem yeah. on the other side and that's why they're they're coming after it uh Max, you may have mentioned Clara, one of our current yep. portfolio companies. It's really all about improving the, the talent management of legacy businesses. The founder uh, worked in workforce consulting for a decade plus years, consulting to you know America's largest businesses in a very consultative approach. I think software can do this better. And right. It- yeah. So you guys, I mean, you get exposure to all kinds of like crazy cool technologies. And I'm sure you, I mean, you guys do have benchmarks and thresholds to say, hey, this checks, you know, whether it's 10 boxes, you have to have 80% for you guys to continue the conversation. But you guys have probably seen some really crazy shit, I mean, over your time. And you guys have probably seen some things you're like, it, this doesn't work for us today, but this has got me interested. And you probably followed those uh, businesses to see where they've gone and where they've ended up. Can you guys give me any examples uh, of things that you guys are like, wow, that's a- an outlier, and I hope they're successful because they got the energy, they got the product, it doesn't align with our investment strategy or doesn't, you know, it's not applicable to our end user customers today or partners. Uh, lab produced meat is <laughs> to me fascinating slash creepy slash world changing <laughs> right, slash yeah. like I want to try it just because I'm yeah. curious. It's um, like eating a tire, right? <laughs> I probably yeah. I, I have no idea is the truth. But uh, and I think it's currently like a, you know, two thousand bucks for an ounce of steak or whatever. But can you cook it rare? I have. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> this is why we didn't invest. Is I was right. we we don't have any expertise yeah. in in biology um, and are not as connected on the ag side as uh, well. Frankly, it's going to be a threat to ag. Uh, so there wasn't the yeah. alignment with Heartland that we kind of yep. demand. Um, so we didn't do it. But it's cool to see that come across i mean it's it's a high profile company um it's a very capital intensive those egg are not people you want to cross either no they they no. unite and they yeah. will come at you yeah. in a hurry so yeah 
And I kind of, I, 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 I sympathize with their stance on that. Yeah. Uh, not just as a threat to their livelihood, but I right. do, I do kind of find it creepy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's weird. I'm going to be thinking about that later. And I'm probably going to Google it here in a little bit. So uh, what about you? you have anything that's kind well, of an outlier? I mean, I think on that point, it's, it's a argument for staying disciplined and staying focused. Yeah. That we, you know, there, there are things that will, you know, it's a word. It's fun to be able to meet these startups and, and look at these. But, uh, you know, it's one thing to get excited about it and kind of be sold on something. And it's another to really understand it and know where you can add value and know where it can go. And, I think that's sort of the difference between, you know, if I'm ever talking to an angel investor or, or anyone who's, you know, trying to kind of get started in this space, it's you know, make sure you're really focused, not just on what gets you excited, but again, what, what, where you have expertise, what you can influence, because then it's going to be things that, you know, you have kind of an unfair advantage compared to the, to the next investor where yeah. you have more information than they do. On the, on the lifestyle, life cycles of technologies, have you guys seen, I mean, you guys are still relatively, you're a young company and you're doing this. Have you guys seen a full life cycle where, you know, we see anywhere from five, you can see something on the low end, five years of the life cycle of a technology before they're moving in and maybe they're replacing it with the newer, better version of that. Uh, or we've seen things that have a 20 year shelf life. Have you guys had the ability to see a full life cycle, something go through or see the next wave of Gen 2, Gen 3? Uh, on our on our portfolio companies, I mean, we've we've certainly we've had some exits in Fund One. Yeah. And that's a pretty young fund. Uh, I think we would suggest that somewhere between like five to eight years is around when you would expect to s- yeah. to see that. Um, so still, many of our Fund One companies are are still growing. What would you guys uh, advice on the other end of on the receiving end? What kind of advice would you give to people that are at these legacy companies trying to solve problems and everything? Um, how, how, what do you say? I mean, outside of, you know, partnering up with you guys saying, Hey, how would you help them engage with yeah. new emerging technologies? There's an inclination on behalf of legacy business to, to shy away from engaging with a startup that's I'm paying with a broad brush, but right. I think that's, that's generally true. We would counsel them not to be reticent. Right. Like I said earlier, the customer is the most important person, especially to an early stage startup. Sure important stakeholder so recognize your value yeah right if you're that legacy business you're you're worth a lot to that startup yeah and um take that into account when when speaking with the startup and understand going in that not everything's going to be perfect but you can gain a lot of upside upside yourself including in shaping the progress of that product over time So, so you're, you know, a lot of what you guys do, which is over and above, people are like, oh, they're a VC, but it's, it's not just strictly a VC. Like we talk, let's go back to the relational piece of this. How often do you see someone come in and the legacy business says, that's it, I want that, but I don't want any of my competitors to have that. That's gotta be kind of a, a tumultuous thing to navigate because this person might say, hey, this is applicable to, you know, a thousand businesses. And if someone wants to be in, you know, you see that shiny, that first, you know, that first girl you date is always gonna have that special spot in your heart. But how do you guys manage those kind of conversations? I I don't I myself have not really run into that too yeah. much. Now we're probably self-selecting out of those instances yeah, because smart. the folks that are involved with Heartland kind of understand what the deal is. Yeah. So we might not be the best to. No, I think that's smart though. I mean, it keeps you guys out of those situations where. I mean, ultimately, our whole goal is to build stickiness and to continue to be a value-added person and. Uh, there's times that we, on a regular basis, say we're not the right partner for you for this reason, and that, that that's a great example of that. So I appreciate that for sure. So um, that's great. So what's what's next for you guys? I mean, we're in heart of Q4 right now. I cannot believe that 2023 is around the corner. What does the next uh, three months, 12 months, 15 months look like for you guys? Uh, continued deployment. Uh, yeah. You know, we, we raised our second fund last year. Um, we're still right in the middle of that. So identifying companies that you know, address the points that we, we mentioned, um, connecting with new companies, legacy companies who, you know, are able to provide feedback on those technologies and, and expanding our network. That's great. Have you guys, are you guys looking, uh, I know Max, you're kind of like Walda, you're, I always ask you where you've been or whatever. Sometimes it's here in the good of US of A, and sometimes it's it's abroad. Have you guys done anything with technologies that are going internationally yet? Oh, we've made a couple of investments in Israeli technology. Yeah. Um, 
and, and we definitely, you know, we don't really shy away from that. Um, if we can be a resource for an Israeli technology that's expanding to the U.S., yep. I think our same value proposition applies. Yeah. Um, you know, because of, I think, when we're investing, few of our companies have really focused on expanding internationally yeah. because there's still, if you're already in the U.S., there's enough opportunity for right. a, a good period of time. Um, so, yeah. It, it's exciting for us when we see the companies that we to help grow here and they go, you know, abroad. And, and it seems like a lot of times once they get abroad, it is gangbusters. Like yeah. things just move a lot. It's like wildfire. And um, you've missed an Israeli company, Hayato, who was on a previous uh, show with us. Um, they're Israeli based. They're fantastic. Uh, I look forward to my weekly call with them. Yeah. I mean, their project managers are interacting with them on a daily basis, but they're just like forward thinking and great in that space. Uh, we just had a, a tech company that we work with, a great partner of ours. I started talking about European expansion. Like, oh, we have a partner that can help you with all these deployments and everything. And they started rattling off countries, you know, England, Italy, France. And they dropped the Kosovo on me, and I was just like, whew, I don't think we'll be going to Kosovo. But it's like, those other countries, we got <laughs> yeah. you covered. But Kosovo is probably not a place that uh, we're going to put boots on the ground. But we will certainly uh, kick the tires on that. So it's just interesting to see that people um, – are innovating and then it's just not just unique to the United States, but there is a lot of opportunity here. It so is. yeah, we're excited to see where our relationship goes with you guys. And this has been great today. And I appreciate you guys taking the time and, and look forward to, you know, helping each other get some exposure to different people and uh, continuing to grow. So thanks for having keep us. Keep up the good work and thanks for everything guys. Thanks Ryan.